Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back from Washington. Uh, thank you for taking time to come in and, and visit. Um, got with me Dr. David Patton, who attended uh, meetings with me in Washington, D.C., as we talked about the Healthy Utah approach as an alternative to Medicaid expansion. And so if we have any technical questions I can answer, I've got Dr. Patton here to give you some of the detail work. But uh, we were received very well. I can tell you that uh, conceptually, uh, Secretary Sebelius and her staff people um, were very willing to engage in talking about the Healthy Utah approach and granting uh, uh, maximum flexibility under a grant, uh, grant, excuse me, maximum flexibility under a block grant uh, approach. Uh, as she said to me, I see nothing in your proposal, Governor, uh, that would be a deal breaker. So uh, I was pleasantly surprised. Dr. Patton and others have been back and kind of introduced the idea and the concept and the principles. So they've had a chance to study it for the last about three weeks. But uh, we were received very well, and uh, indications are that we can, in fact, uh, resolve this over the next couple of months as we work on some of the details. I then spent time with the White House with their senior advisors on health care, those who actually helped draft the Affordable Care Act. And uh, their comment to me was uh, this was never designed to be a one-size-fits-all approach. So we embrace your proposal here to have a unique Utah solution that deals with your own unique demographics, your uh, culture, your politics. And they saw nothing that would offend them in embracing the Healthy Utah proposal. So in, in both of the areas, the Department of Health with Secretary Sebelius, with the White House advisors, their senior staff members on health care, I was received very well and am confident that over the next few weeks we can work out some of the nuances and the details and find uh, an agreement uh, to the Healthy Utah proposal. The key issues for them and for us, uh, which would have been maybe considered sticking points, are the idea of a work requirement, which you don't have in Medicaid, but a work requirement, similar to what we have, by the way, in our temporary aid to needy families, our TANF program. And we said we think it's important that there's a work requirement, meaning that those that can are able to work and do work, that they're looking for work. We know there's some that can't, and, and they would be excluded from this, but generally speaking, those that can and are able to work should be working. Secondly, we talked about adjusting of the co-pays. The co-pays under Medicaid have not been adjusted for years, and they haven't even been adjusted for inflation. So there's a natural, I think, logical uh, argument that they ought to be adjusted anyway. And uh, so co-pays, meaning that the recipients will have some skin in the game. Uh, they have some involvements and, and it helps them uh, to feel like it's not just a government dole, that they are actually paying uh, at least partially their own way. And that has to do with, too, the third area, and that's premium payments. Uh, particularly for those that are above poverty, 100% to 133% above poverty, uh, on an ability to pay on a sliding scale based on your income, there ought to be some responsibility for the recipient to make at least a part of the payment on the premium. Those below 100% maybe a little different category. Um, but again, uh, all three of those principles uh, they said, yes, we agree with those principles and those concepts. And as I said, Secretary Spilia said, in the proposals that we see here, that you've given to us, uh, we see nothing that would be a deal breaker. So that's kind of the overall essence of, of my trip to Washington uh, on health care and uh, the alternative Medicaid expansion. So what questions do you have for me? When you presented Healthy Utah first, you mentioned the number, if I recall correctly, of $400 a year. Does that cover all three, the, the, the co-pay, the, or both the co-pay and the, and the premium? Or could you explain 
sort of the how that how that looks for life. I don't recall ever saying four hundred dollars a year, so I don't know if uh, Dr. Patton is there something that's come out of our proposal has given us any kind of a specific number on what the shared responsibility would be for the recipient. We were <coughs> we might come over here where the cameras can see you better. Yeah, we were estimating about a two percent of income uh, level, and some people equated that to about four hundred dollars a year. That's typically applied to people over the one hundred percent poverty threshold. So that's not, we're not talking about that for the whole entire uh, population of 111,000. Uh, a percent would make more sense to me because then it's proportionate. So if you make more money, you'll pay a little bit more. Right. But if you make less money, you'll pay a little bit less. And maybe below 100% of poverty won't pay anything. Where are you gonna, what are you gonna do with the money? Suppose you, got, you have 100 off thousand people and supposing they're paying uh, $200 or I don't know, on average, that's some money. Where does the money go? Well, we'd be going into paying for the health care. I mean, it's just like anything else. It's, it's their premium payments, and we have to administer the, the program ourselves. So we'll go into the overall Health of Utah program as a revenue stream to pay for the operation. Does it reduce the state share or the federal share, or does it increase the amount of money that goes to the doctor? Where, if, I don't know. You, you got what, tens of millions of bucks. Where do you know what you're going to do with it? It's just like your uh, insurance. You pay a premium on your own insurance. You have a, a stake in your insurance uh, benefit. This would be the same thing. So the individual would pay into their insurance plan. It wouldn't probably change the state or the federal share. That would be arranged ahead of time with that premium anticipated. So. It would be just part of their insurance plan. Some to the state, some to the feds. In essence, you could see it as working out that way, but really it's just what they pay into their insurance plan. So how, how, much money, you, how much money is the grant going to be for? You talk about a block grant. Well, it, it, it's not a frozen number, um, but our estimates would be $258 million. That's a pretty clear estimate. Yeah. Is, and that's how much money is estimated to go on to Medicaid. Yes, and so it depends on the actual number of recipients, and there's some you know latitude there. But that's the approximation of. Uh, again, our argument is under the Affordable Care Act, Utahns are being taxed. This is a specific tax under the Affordable Care Act to pay for uh, all things uh, associated with the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. We send about $680 million back to Washington. They redirect $258 million approximately into what we call Medicaid expansion. And we're just saying that rather than put it into a Medicaid program, uh, we want to put it into a Healthy Utah program because we believe that you can get more efficiencies in a state-run program. You can find more uh, 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 better health care, better accessibility, and more choice. You can picture, you know, a lot of different insurance programs out there that you could choose from that would be tailor-made for your individual family needs. So access to better quality and more choice and better health care is what the outcomes of this will be as opposed to the more of a one-size-fits-all program of Medicaid. What about the question? Can you get back to the um, $400 and the 2%? Um, I guess I'm a little unclear more efficient if people end up spending more money. If we just accepted the Medicaid expansion as a state, people wouldn't be spending that 2%, correct? So this program actually costs more to people than uh, just a straight up Medicaid expansion. Well, it depends on if you have if you have delays in getting into your doctor under Medicaid. We have many doctors that don't want to take Medicaid patients. You limit your choice. I've used, I've used the example before of my sister who had her husband uh, pass away suddenly this past year at age 55 and uh, died of a heart attack training for his fifth marathon. But uh, they have a special needs child and uh, she's been on Medicaid virtually since birth. But my sister said to me, Gary, I'm going to do everything I can to stay off of Medicaid. I want to ask her why, because I said, well, Medicaid's kind of designed to help people in your circumstance. She said, I've seen the treatment that my daughter's received, the quality of the health care, uh, and I don't like it. And my insurance has treated me much better. 
I want to make sure I have my own insurance program. And frankly, under our proposal with Health of Utah, my sister will be able to take her daughter off of the Medicaid rolls and enroll her into an insurance program, which she thinks, as a mother, is going to be better for her child. So that's not everybody's circumstance and situation, but I believe that the choices that were given, the ability the state will have to find more efficiencies and giving better health care. In, in Indiana, for example, which is a similar kind of a program, they're offering now vision and dental as, a, as an option under the Healthy Indiana Plan, which you don't get with Medicaid. So uh, we have to work on this. That's why it's a pilot program. We're going to monitor what takes place with the recipients. Are they getting good health care? Are they getting it in a timely fashion? Are they getting good service? Are they getting better choices? We'll analyze that over the next two or three years. Uh, we're going to also monitor what the federal government's doing. Are they able, capable, willing to honor their commitments to us as a partner in this effort? And we're going to thirdly monitor the cost to the, to the uh, uh, Utah taxpayers ongoing as part of our own go ongoing state budget requirements to see how that works. I expect at the end of three years on this pilot program we'll have some suggestions and recommendations of maybe making some improvements here and there. This has worked well, this has not worked so well, and so we'll make some modifications and changes. But this will be a work in progress. We don't have all the answers to the issues because we don't know what all the questions are. But I'm confident this is going to be a better approach for the Utah citizens and taxpayers than just taking on Medicaid uh, expansion. So where, where are you in, in the process of getting this approved and implemented? Do you still need to go to D.C. before you go to the legislature? Um, you know, what, what happens next? I think it will be a, a concurrent uh, you know, work in progress as we negotiate with uh, the Department of Health and put in the details, this is how much the copay is going to be, this will be, it's going to be a 2% or a 1.9% cost for premium, uh, this is the work requirements we lift from TANF and put into the Healthy Utah Plan, so those things will be worked out, but at the same time we'll be always be keeping the legislature up to speed on those negotiations so that they know what we're doing and uh, there won't be someday a here it is, and a big surprise. It'll be something we'll do in collaboration with the legislature. And then my anticipation will be that sometime later this year, uh, hopefully by the end of the summer, we'll have the opportunity to come back into special session and uh, prove the agreements we have with the, with the uh, uh, Obama administration and accept the money and start the program. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Did you, when you have these discussions with the secretary, were you talking about the 90-10 split still? Are they going? Are they willing to go to the full match? Or we're talking about a 100% split, 100% responsibility, and then gradually as you go to the 90-10, which is the same program. This is a three-year pilot program. We'd have 100%, and then uh, it would gradually then go to the 90-10. But I don't think I don't think it's one step. I think there's multiple steps before you get to the 90-10. But yeah, the same kind of thing that we've been proposed out there is what we'd be as far as the federal government share. Which again, I want to emphasize, this is Utah specific, specific taxes being charged for the under the Affordable Care Act, which is the law of the land. Our Utah taxpayers are being taxed specifically, and we're going to have some of that money come back and be spent by Utah. I'd rather have the money spent by Utah people than by the federal government. I think we can find more efficiencies and, and more, uh, have a more effective program in helping the people. At the end of the day, it's about the people. And so I believe this program will be better for the people. At this point, at this point or does that cost include the the price of administering this program is the health department uh, prepared to deal with that because that seems it seems like you're creating a whole new branch of the health department just to administer the, the healthy utah solution mm -hmm. that true? there are some programs which will become obsolete with the embracement and the creation of healthy utah so those other programs which we administer now, the savings from that will now be used and redirected into the administration of the Healthy Utah program. So I think it will be virtually revenue neutral. should not be any cost. We also have the ability, as we're talking about this, to if we find efficiencies in the system, which I believe we can, uh, you know, to have those savings, again, inure to this program. 
Uh, maybe we can, in fact, add vision and dental. Who knows what we can do down the road. We have a lot of um, discussion with other governors, uh, Democrat as well as Republican, saying that if they would take away the strings, we can find more efficiencies in the system. We can be more innovative. We can create better processes. Transportation, for example, which is uh, we have a lot of federal dollars that go into our transportation system. We have contractors that say we could save, uh, you know, 15 or 20 percent on the cost of our roads if we didn't have so many strings, red tape, and hoops to jump through. And so uh, that's an example of where we can find savings in transportation. I expect we can find savings uh, with new innovation and new processes and, and less red tape with a state-run program than with a federal Medicaid program, which has become so difficult that doctors say, I don't want to participate. It's not just the, re the amount of money that they're getting compensated, but it's the red tape. I, you talk to doctors, they have somebody that's working full-time now just to fill out the forms for Medicaid. That's that's kind of crazy. So we're going to try to simplify the system and give better health care and create better outcomes with a Utah-driven program as an alternative to Medicaid expansion. At this point, just one more, please. Are you still encountering this philosophical difference, uh, you know, from some people about this taking the federal what has been portrayed as the mm -hmm. federal money, even though it's Utah taxes going back to the federal government, the, the federal you know, block grant, in fact, are you getting feedback from people still that that's not a good idea and that you're encountering that as part of this discussion? Yeah. There are some that think this is just taking federal money and just the idea of taking federal money is somehow, somehow evil. It's just not a good thing to do. What they mean is we don't want to add to the fiscal irresponsibility of Washington, D.C., that's really what they're saying. The money doesn't get necessarily tainted as it goes through Washington, D.C. and comes back to us. We have shared responsibility, and part of our budget right now, about $3.5 billion, come from shared responsibilities that are generated from our taxpayers that we work with the federal government uh, in areas of public safety, uh, national defense, you know, highways, education, health and human services. So I understand the concern of federal irresponsibility when it comes to fiscal matters, and that's a legitimate issue. This is a little bit different in that this is not borrowed money from China. Uh, this, is, uh, this is money that has been earmarked that people of Utah are paying specific taxes that are earmarked for this specific program that we can either take back or we can leave on the table and the federal government will spend it someplace else. But we're going to be charged whether we use it or not. And so I think that's part of the misunderstanding. We need to make sure that people who don't like the fiscal irresponsibility don't equate the fact that we want to take and spend the money in more responsible ways than the federal government to somehow they're the same, because they're not. Uh, I would say to all of us, the more we can have the states, and I would say to all 50 states, the more that the states can have the responsibility of spending the money they will find efficiencies, they'll find more uh, and better ways to do things that give better outcomes than a federal government is so bloated and so far removed from the, from the circumstances that they don't make good decisions. They're bloated with red tape and regulations that causes people to not have the appropriate outcomes that are designed in theory, uh, well intended as they may be. So uh, I think we'll be able to, to get past to some of the ideology and talk about this is a better way to spend taxpayers' dollars, more responsible to the taxpayer, and it really does help people in a better way than the one-size-fits-all Medicaid. And once we get that out there and understand that, I think most of us will come together and say, you know, this is just common sense. And I do believe that this is just a common sense solution. By the way, I do believe other states around the country are watching us in a significant way, and if we can I put together what I think we can here in this more of a block grant approach with the states being able to define the parameters and, and address the issues. I think you'll find other states will want to follow uh, Utah's example.